Hello everyone, welcome to this year in review video. My name is Chris Lloyd, this is Books Up Close. If you're a new viewer, welcome to the channel. If you are an old viewer, I'm sorry I haven't made a long video in a really long time. Um, the day job has taken over, so you've only been getting the quick TikTok videos. But this is going to be a long, <laughs> rambling, end of year summary of all the things that I've consumed, enjoyed, and liked. Speaking of, if you like this video, please like, please subscribe if you haven't already, and ring the bell for notifications, and leave comments below. I want to hear what you've been consuming all year, what you've been reading, listening to, and watching. You can also find me on TikTok, on Instagram, on Goodreads, I've rejoined that, so please do follow me there. And on Instagram, I will be in particular looking forward to hearing your reading resolutions, your reading intentions, manifestations for next year, the books you're looking forward to, maybe things you want to read more of, or less of, or new authors you want to explore. So please do let me know, I'm really interested to hear what you're looking forward to in 2024. Which, as I heard on a podcast the other day, <laughs> someone said, those are numbers that don't make any sense. Which is true, but we're heading there, so I look forward to hearing from you about that. Okay, so I'm going to take you through books first, then some TV, then some podcasts, then some music that I've been loving this year. And we're going to start with the 2023 titles, which I'm really bad at doing, um, of keeping up to date on brand new books that come out. But I also read some other things that I think you will like and I want to shout about again, some of which I've reviewed very briefly. So the first on my list is Henry Hoke's Open Throat, which if you haven't read already is a novel in verse told by a queer mountain lion living in LA who interacts with humans, is learning language through interacting with the humans. Is It's a book about the climate, how we treat outsiders. It's a book about the body and understanding identity. It is fascinating. It's beautifully written. It is so engaging. And I've been writing about it a little bit in my new uh, academic book, so I'm really excited to share that at some point. There is a list of mountain lions in US fiction that I'm really interested in, but um, this book is beautiful, you have to read it. It's really short and succinct and you will love it, I promise. My second suggestion is Sarah Ahmed's book The Feminist Killjoy Handbook, which again um, I've spoken about before and you know I love Sarah's work, and this is a very accessible, if you like, entry point into her work. Not that her academic books are unaccessible in any way, but it's like the first major kind of trade publication uh, that she's published, and it's really great. It's like a book that you can take with you everywhere you can dip into. You don't have to read it like straight through in a kind of linear way. There's lots of like take home ideas, there's things to put into practice, there's stuff you can talk about with friends in reading groups at work. It's really great, a really provocative and useful guide to living a life as a feminist killjoy and interrupting the status quo. My third book, kind of following on from that, is Christina Sharp's Incredible Ordinary Notes. Again, Sharp's kind of first trade publication after two academic books, and it is stunning. It is a meditation on life and blackness and identity and memory and art. It's written in these short notes, these little fragments that reflect on different ideas and concepts and they kind of return and cycle back around. It's really beautiful. It's hard to get through in places. It's profound. It's just a really stunning book and it looks beautiful, especially the UK version from Daunt Books, who always do great things. Um, please do get it. It's a real marvel. Other 2023 book that I loved was Anne Enright's The Wren, The Wren. I love Anne Enright. I've not read a bad book by her so far. She just writes beautiful sentences. Like at the sentence level, she is great. But it's also a great story about family and what we leave each other and the kind of inheritance. So it's about kind of three generations, a famous male poet in Ireland, and then his daughter and her daughter. And you see the kind of reverberations across time of relationships, desire, art making, poetry is really wonderful. I flew through it. You have to definitely get that book. And the final 2023 book that I loved is Brian Washington's Family Meal. Again, I've talked about Brian Washington before. I love Memorial so much as a novel. I love Lot as well, the short stories. Less than the novel, but they're still fantastic. And Family Meal is a real extension of his work. It 
continues to explore themes of loneliness, connection, family, again, inheritance. It's great on the sensuality of food, of the body, of identity, of place. It's again, another novel set in Houston and you really feel like you are there. I highly recommend it. I think he's a really, really great writer. Then a couple of 2022 books, just because I only read them in 2023. Uh, the first being Diego Garcia by Natasha Subramanian and Luke Williams. And it's a strange, interesting, metafictional, autofictional, collaborative novel that has different forms in it. It does really interesting things on the page and how the two authors wrote it together and thought about it together across their gendered and racial differences but as well as like, what does it mean to collaborate in art making? But it's also about the history of the island, Diego de Garcia and Mauritius. So it's about empire and colonialism and memory and time and so many things. And I don't know how they do it. And that was published by Fitzcarraldo. So a huge recommendation for me on that one. I also loved Julia Armfield, Our Wives Under the Sea. Uh, I'm not the only person obviously that loved that book, uh, but it's so good. It's so, so good about a couple, the aftermath of one woman going on a submarine voyage that goes wrong. And then when she returns, she just finds herself always needing to be in bath water. It's about relationships. It is about trauma, but not trauma in the way that has taken over publishing. I think it's way more nuanced and delicate than that. And it is just vibrantly written. The prose is stunning. And I can't wait for Armfield's new book, which is coming out next year. So I'm gonna buy that straight away. Then the other two, again, very formally inventive books. One is The Swimmers by Julie Otsuka that I cannot recommend highly enough that I keep giving to people. It's, I can't really tell you what it's about because it will spoil something that happens in the third chapter. But the first two chapters are about a swimming pool and a group of people that go there every day. And in the second chapter, the, a crack appears in the pool and it suddenly spins out from there. And the third chapter takes a swerve in a very different direction. I think it's one of the cleverest things I've read in a long time. And again, the prose is beautiful. It's heartbreaking. I cried. Please do read it. I can't say more than that, <laughs> but it is incredible at the formal and the emotional level, which is my kind of book, really. And then the final one is Namwali Serpel's book, The Furrows, which is a book about grief and loss and the cycle of time and the return of trauma. Uh, again, formally really daring, follows a woman who, whose brother goes missing when she's younger, when she's supposed to be looking after him. And we hear the story once and then it spins around and we hear it a second time, but he is lost in a different way, in a different context. And then it happens a third time. And it keeps happening that the narrator is returning to this scene in different settings and you kind of lose sense on what is the real story, what's the imagined story. And then she meets someone romantically who reminds her of her brother and then it breaks, the novel breaks in the middle and changes tack and orientation. Again, a really experimental, interesting, formal use of like what the novel can do to explore pain, history, memory, and all the things. Those are my big 2022 and 2023 books. I also want to make a uh, reference to a couple of books that my friends brought out and that's not me flexing by the way, like these are my friends, but rather I want to flag that up just in case you're like, Chris, we know you're friends with these people. Uh, of course you're gonna recommend these books, but no, I'm friends with a lot of people. I wanna recommend these books because I think they are wonderful. And I just love having really talented friends who I can celebrate. It makes me very, very happy. So the first is Kieran Yates's book, All the Houses I've Ever Lived In, which I've put before on socials. It is fantastic. It is about the housing crisis. It's about family, how we make meaning in culture and through culture. Uh, a really devastating kind of skewering of the UK's long housing crisis and the ways in which we might collaborate to rebuild the future. Then I want to recommend uh, Sean Hewitt's beautiful book, 300,000 Kisses, uh, illustrated by Luke Edward Hall, um, beautiful fragments of classic poetry and other kinds of writing about queer love, romance, desire. A really lovely, a lovely, beautiful book to hold, to have on your coffee table, to dip into over the holidays. Recommend it highly. I want to recommend Harry Nicholas's book, uh, Trans Man Walks Into a Gay Bar, which is such an honest, funny, thoughtful look at the trans experience from his point of view and 
kind of assimilating, moving into the gay community. It's great on the body, on family, on friends, on all the things. It is really open as a book, and I love that from an author. Then I want to recommend Greekling by Kostia Tsoulakis, which is a great poetry collection about his Greek identity. It's about crumbling statues. It's about family. It's about history. Love it. Highly recommend. And then the last book is a beautiful pamphlet called Two Dying Lovers Holding a Cat, a poetry pamphlet by Luis Costa, who is a great poet, wonderful on the body, on the senses, on desire, on food. Some really beautiful poems in there, and it's being published by 14 poems, uh, the wonderful people over there, who will also be publishing my pamphlet in 2024. Let's keep an eye out for that. I'm sure I'll return to talk to you about that. So those are my book recommendations for the year. I'm going to move to TV very quickly. I haven't watched much new television this year. I'm watching old things and starting from the beginning of others. So not huge things here. And I'm not going to surprise you with any of these. You probably have already seen them. So <laughs> nothing new. But The Bear season two uh, blew my mind. The Christmas episode in particular is one of the best things I've ever seen. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis deserves all the prizes for that <laughs> performance. I obviously love The Last of Us because it's great and now I'm playing the game so I'm now hooked on that train. But the big thing which you may not have seen that you do need to see is Poker Face which is Ryan Johnson's TV show. Uh, I love Ryan Johnson as a director, I actually think his Star Wars films are good. You can come for me in the comments, I don't care. I think narratively he's really interesting and this series gives him that space to kind of unfurl a story. It's a crime detective show without the detective. Natasha Leone is brilliant as always, like just so charismatic on screen. It's cleverly put together, like formally, it's quite clever. You can see a theme here of the things I like this year, uh, but I highly recommend. I binged it so quickly, so go watch that. I then also wanna recommend some podcasts that I've been enjoying. They've been keeping me company this year, especially driving to work and back. First up in kind of book podcasts, uh, Reading the Room is a great podcast by Jalen Lopez um, on YouTube. He's The Bar and the Bookcase. And he's got some really great interviews on that show. There's a great woman, Brian Washington, that I particularly liked for obvious reasons. Yeah, there's some really, really great interviews. And he asks lovely questions about form. So I'm fully on board that, as you will know, and really asking authors like how they put together the books they make. And, and that always fascinates me. So go subscribe to that one. In other related book podcasts, uh, I recommend If Books Could Kill, which is the newest podcast from Michael Hobbs, one of my favourite people who is just great on debunking things and is like, actually, that's not the case. Uh, along with Peter Shamsiri, who also presents 5 to 4, which I'm going to come back to. But this podcast takes apart those big airport bestsellers, you know, the really big New York Times bestselling books on like how to make more money in life and how to be calmer, all these kinds of stupid things. And they just take the books apart piece by piece and it's hilarious, it's clever, it's smart. Uh, it's the podcast I didn't know I needed, but you have to listen to it. It is brilliant. I laugh really hard and learn things along the way. So talking of five to four is a great podcast about the Supreme Court. Uh, the podcast tagline is, uh, this is a podcast about why the Supreme Court sucks. So they take apart in each episode a landmark Supreme Court case and they go through what happened, the facts, um, and then the major decision and the dissents. And it is really, again, a clear-sighted taking apart of the ways in which democracy is completely under threat in the United States and has been for a long time and how the Supreme Court is a pivotal part of undoing those freedoms. So it is wonderful. It is angry as well as funny and thoughtful. So go subscribe. I then want to make a special reference to Death Panel, which you have, if you haven't listened to, is really good on kind of public health concerns. They've had some wonderful episodes this year on Gaza and Palestine that are really worth listening to. And they've also been tracking over the past couple of years in particular, the COVID pandemic and its kind of fallout and what they're now theorizing as the sociological production of the end of the pandemic, that's their term, i.e. the way in which the end of the pandemic has been made into a thing through society, through government, and how that's a problem for everyone. Some really fabulous episodes there. Again, angry, clear-sighted, worth listening to. Then three podcasts that 
a kind of coming to an end or maybe are coming to an end, which is really sad. One is definitely ending and that's Literary Friction, which has had some great interviews with authors, uh, but they've just published the last episode of that. It's been a decade of the show and that's gonna be sad to not hear new ones because they get really good authors on there. But the other two are really definitely breaking my heart. One is Death, Sex and Money, which I think is one of the best shows in the history of the world ever. And WMYC may not be renewing it, so we don't know what's happening with the show. So that's really sad because I, every episode is wonderful and smart and clever and thoughtful. So please subscribe to that, give them money, do all the things we need to save this podcast. And the other one is Heavyweight, uh, which is from Gimlet Studios, presented by Jonathan Goldstein, who used to be on This American Life and other things. And it's so good. As in every episode I've heard has been flawlessly made. It's funny, it's sad, I will cry every episode. It's about people revisiting something from their past, either like a person or a memory or an event or a fact or a family member. It is just so perfectly made. The tone is just right. Um, if you haven't listened, you've got some great seasons to catch up on. Uh, but I don't know what the future of that show is gonna be, so that's also hurting me right now. So I'm gonna have to go back and listen to the beginning. There are loads of other podcasts I've listened to too, but those are the big ones I wanna kind of shout out because I think they're great. And if you're not listening, you need to. And finally, turning to music. Uh, these aren't gonna be like the best albums of the year. You're gonna not necessarily agree that these are the best albums of the year, but they're the albums that spoke to me the most and that I played the most and that I love. And I think you should love too. The first is Emily King's album called Special Occasion, which came out earlier in the year. It's really, really good. Emily King, I heard a long time ago and then kind of forgot about her. And then this album came out and I listened to it and I've then demolished her entire back catalogue. She is so good, unbelievably good. The song Easy is, is in my top five of the year, Spotify told me so. Um, it's such a heartbreaking song about two people who've just come out of relationships and then tried to make a new relationship and how it should be easy, but it isn't. Ugh, it's such a heartbreaking song, but it's beautifully produced. Her voice is like better than ever. The production is gorgeous. Yeah, highly recommend. Also, This Year is a great song in the album. Sorry, I wasn't done. This Year is like a really kind of like, this year I'm gonna get stuff done, it's gonna be my year. Um, so you might wanna take that one into your January 2024 when things are bleak outside. At least they are here in the UK. The other, probably won't surprise many of you, is Troy Sivan's Something We Give Each Other. Almost forgot the title there. Uh, which is a great, great pop album. I've always liked Troy. His other albums are great. The EPs in between are great. Not enough people talk about them. But this album is really joyous. The two lead singles were all over my socials and all over YouTube. Um, I imagine you've been listening too. I would definitely be going to see him when he comes to London next year. And my favorite song at the moment on that album is Honey. It's upbeat, it's joyous. It is what pop music should be. Go listen. I also love Tori Kelly. She is wonderful. She had an album out, like a mini album called Tori, and it's a very definitive swerve to an R&B lane away from the more kind of poppy acoustic end of things. And it's a really good move for her. Uh, it's really good, great songs on there. I would highly recommend all of it because it's a very short kind of album, but go watch the Vivo live versions of three of the songs. You will not be disappointed. I don't know how her voice does the things it does, but there we are. And while you're at it, go watch her live Christmas album performance as well. Um, it's phenomenal. Then I want to talk about Anoni's album. It's called My Back Was A Bridge For You To Cross, and it is stunning. Like I've always loved Anoni's voice, but on here, this production, it's like indebted to kind of Motown and soul and jazz, but also some more kind of like folky acoustic stuff. It is a beautiful album. It reminds me of this kind of like 60s moment of kind of protest songs. It's thinking about violence. It's thinking about the climate as Anoni often does. The title is wonderful. Um, and I would highly recommend the song Can't, which is sad, furious, and beautiful. I can't say more than that really. A little shout out to Jesse Ware, who you all will probably love anyway. I love this album, that feels good. Begin Again is my favourite on that album. Um, I think it's beautiful. And the album version is much longer than the single and it, yeah, I love that latter half of that song. Another unsurprising choice for those of you that know me is uh, Kalila's album Raven. And the song Raven 
is my favorite on it and contact as well is also really good uh, again she is just a beautiful voice like the tone is incredible but the production on this album you really need to listen to it with headphones and just like sink into it it's it's just a vibe from start to finish it's moody it's introspective and you will love it in these winter months and then finally i want to recommend michelle and de Gaiacello's album the omnicord real book She's great. I mean, I love all of her albums. She has also done a number of things with kind of genre bending and fusing. And this album is really great in that regard. Each song is its own entire world, I think. And it is worth listening just for that from beginning to end, just the wit, the places she goes to sonically, emotionally. I love the song Good Good on it, which is really beautiful. Yeah, a highlight for me. A really, really gorgeous album. And then a little sneaky under the wire suggestion is Carrie Underwood's album from this year. And I know she's like problematic, etc., etc. So let's just hold that in mind. But it's a really, really good album called Denim and Rhinestones. From beginning to end, this is like country pop at, at its best. And I think it's her best album, actually. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's like the best thing she's done. Each song is pop joy her voice is great the production's really rich and full like if you like that kind of country pop stuff i would listen to it so those are my recommendations that is a whistle stop tour of everything or most of the things i've been loving this year so what i want from you is in the comments tell me what you've been reading listening to what podcast you'd recommend tag people share things below let me know if you've read or heard any of the things i mentioned and we can agree or fight about it i don't mind whatever you need so as ever thank you for watching really appreciate you and i will make more of these longer videos in the new year i promise i've got a little bit less teaching to do so i might have some more time in the week to make these videos but until then i hope you have wonderful holidays and a great new year and you read loads of books and i'll see you soon